Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of 10 to Life with me, Annie Elise. If you are brand new to the channel, that's okay. Welcome, I'm so happy to have you here. Let me give you the little breakdown of what it is we do over here. I basically sit here and I tell you about a true crime case that I have been researching that's like kind of sticking in my mind for one reason or another, and we just talk about it as friends. Now, for those of you who are returning 10 to lifers, you already know the drill. You know what we do here. So first and foremost, welcome back. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for being a 10 to lifer, whether you have been here since we were a baby channel back in 2020 or you're brand new. It doesn't matter. I'm just happy to have you guys. Now, I want to talk to you today about coincidences in true crime. Crime coincidences. I mean, I guess there's a million ways you could do a little play on word, right? But my question for you is at what point is a coincidence not a coincidence anymore? Or when is an accident not an accident? That is the big central question that today's case really has me wondering about. It's a story where these horrible, unpredictable tragedies just keep happening to this same family. And they are just mysterious enough that you have to ask yourself, is this just a string of bad luck that's deadly? Or is there something else really going on here? So guys, we are gonna jump right in. All right, guys, so I think that we can all agree here that getting in debt is so easy, but getting out feels like the system is set up so that we don't. The anxiety, too, the stress of it all, it can be, like, just soul-crushing. I get all of that, and I'm here to say you don't have to go at it alone. There is a way out. Help is available. That is thanks to PDS Debt. PDS Debt has customized options for anybody struggling with credit cards, with personal loans, collections, or medical bills. They truly care about getting you out of debt. PDS rolls all of your monthly payments into one low, interest-free monthly payment. So if you're making payments every month on your debt, but your balances, like, they aren't going down, this program is for you. Everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies, and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit is accepted. Now get this, PDS Debt is a top-rated company on Google, and they have an A-plus rating on the Better Business Bureau. So save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis, and it only takes 30 seconds. So head over to pdsdebt.com slash 10 to life to get your free debt assessment today. So let's backtrack to when Christina Alexander and Carl Carlson met in Grand Forks, North Dakota in the early 1980s. Carl was originally from rural New York, and he enlisted with the Air Force after high school, which is how he ended up in North Dakota. See, he was stationed there for a few years, and then he met Christina. She also goes by Chris for short. She was very short, but she was also kind of like this tiny little ball of energy. I mean, just think this. This friendly, super charismatic woman who was just always laughing. That was Christina. So when Christina and Carl met, it was like they were made for each other. An instant connection. Christina was going through a divorce and Carl was by her side every single step of the way. He supported her and helped her move on emotionally. Not that every interaction between them was focused on Christina's troubles, though. I mean, they actually had a very similar sense of humor, too. And Carl and Christina just loved making each other laugh. It was just beyond anything they had ever had before. It was such a good connection, and there was also physical attraction, too. Carl was this tall country guy, and Christina was this little beautiful ball of energy. I mean, a perfect match, right? So they hit it off, and in no time at all, Christina became pregnant. So the couple decided to get married in 1983. The baby was a girl, who they named Aaron. And then later, the couple had a second child, a boy named Levi. But Carl and Christina weren't financially ready to support a family of four, and they struggled to make ends meet. 
So eventually, they decided to move to Carl's hometown in Seneca Falls, New York. They hoped that they would have a bit more stability there, and plus, they'd be close to Carl's family, so it seemed like a win-win. So Carl got a job working at a local stone quarry, and they had another child together, and this was a daughter named Katie. But the move didn't actually fix their financial problems. So Christina's dad offered Carl a better job, but to take it, he would have to move in with his family again. Now, all the way across the country to California, where Christina was from. Now, understandably, Carl wasn't thrilled about uprooting his entire life again, but Christina, she couldn't have been more excited. The new job was close to where her sister Colette lived, and Christina really missed her family, and she wanted to be closer to them for years. So this was really something that she was looking forward to, and her excitement was enough for Carl to set aside any reservations that he had. So he took the job, and the Carlsons made their way to Murphy's, California. Which, I want to be clear, life in California was anything but glamorous. Their house was tiny, it was run down, and worst of all, Carl still wasn't making that much money. Christina wasn't bringing in anything either as a homemaker, but she did find different creative ways to keep her family on budget. She kept bills low by learning how to make home decor herself, including sewing her own curtains, I mean, ultra-talented, and the kids saw how hard Christina was working, but they couldn't help but notice how tense things were now getting between their mom and their dad. When Christina and the children were home alone, things were easy, and she was carefree. But then, the moment that Carl got back, the whole vibe would just change, instantly. It was like all of the tension would just descend on them right away, and it wouldn't lift until he left the house again. He was also angry a lot. He yelled at Christina all the time and tried to control everything. So his constant fights with his wife frequently got out of control. For example, when Christina turned 30 years old, Carl arranged a photo shoot for her as a birthday present. But when it was time for her to get in front of the camera, Christina was feeling a little bit self-conscious. I mean, she had had three kids. Her body wasn't what it used to be back in her 20s. So you would think that in a situation like this, it would be obvious what Carl would do, right? Or what he should do. He should reassure Christina, remind her that she's still beautiful. I mean, that's how you handle people's insecurities, right? Especially if you love them and you're trying to make them feel confident. Well, Carl did about the worst possible thing a man could ever do. He called his wife chubby and also a fatty. He also said that she looked like a whore because of the amount of makeup that she was wearing. I mean, what the hell kind of way is that to talk to anyone, but especially your wife, who's already feeling down on herself, you know? Now, as all of this was happening, Christina's sister Colette witnessed all of this firsthand because she was there to help get Christina ready for this photo shoot. And this wasn't the only time that she saw Carl disrespect Christina. She knew Carl was mean and really rude, and frankly, she hated her brother-in-law. And at this point, Christina was also finally getting fed up. She was slowly starting to realize that Carl was the problem here, that nothing she did was ever good enough for him. Plus, he was constantly acting jealous and controlling. I mean, it was just horrible and unpleasant. So by 1990 or so, Christina told Colette that she wanted to leave Carl. So Colette told her sister that they could all live together until Christina got back on her feet, and it seemed like they had a solid plan to move forward. But unfortunately, that never happened. See, on New Year's Day 1991, Carl called 911 from his neighbor's home, and he said that his house was on fire. He'd helped his children get to safety, but he hadn't been able to save his wife, Christina. Christina was trapped inside the house. As soon as they got the call, the firefighters and the paramedics headed to the scene, but Christina was already dead. Her body was still in the bathtub where she had been bathing before the fire ensued and the house was engulfed in flames. And while there was very little damage in the bathroom itself, Christina had died of smoke inhalation. Her sister Colette heard about the fire and she raced to the house to find out what had happened. First, she talked to Aaron, the oldest child, who was now just six years old. And Aaron said, I heard mommy calling for daddy, and daddy ignored her. Now remember, Colette already did not like Carl and saw him as this like controlling, angry, evil man. 
And you can't always take a six-year-old at their word, but there were plenty of other reasons for Colette to now be even more suspicious of him. So she demanded to see her sister, Christina. And Carl said to her, you can't. She's a crispy critter. A direct quote. I mean, can you even imagine what the hell is going on here? His wife just died, but he's like making some sort of callous joke here saying, you can't. She's a crispy critter now. It is so disgusting and so cold. It is not not good. So Colette also could not believe it, but she tried to remain calm. She knew that it was more important to get the story out of Carl than it was to just go off on him, as tempting as it was for her to just like chew him out and just like ream into him. So Colette set her emotions aside. She kept her voice as steady as she could, and she asked Carl what he wanted to do with Christina's body. She knew that Christina would have wanted to be buried, but Carl, he said that he wanted to cremate her instead. And that's exactly what he did. Christina's funeral was a few days later, and while Carl was there, he didn't do much to actually plan it. He also didn't let his kids come to their own mother's service. Can you even imagine? And at the service, Carl didn't seem to be especially grief-stricken, and he kind of just like hung near the back instead of mingling with other guests, greeting them. He just kind of like stood back, just a little bit emotionless. Now, in all fairness, everybody mourns and grieves differently. We know that. I mean, emotions can hit people at surprising times, and some people aren't showy about their feelings, period, even when they are struggling. So I do not at all want to suggest that his behavior at the funeral on its own merits any sort of criticism, but when you look at it as part of a pattern, along with his mistreatment of his wife and his six-year-old daughter Aaron's suggestion that he never tried to even rescue his wife, I mean, it starts to paint a pretty sinister picture, right? And it's worth highlighting that as a whole, his behavior implied that he really didn't even care about Christina or care about the fact that she was now dead. So right after this, like, and I'm talking right after, within like four days, four days after the fire, he took the kids and he moved back to New York, which remember, he never really even wanted to be in California, but this still feels like a pretty abrupt move. Christina's entire family was shocked, especially her sister Colette. She still wanted to be close to her nieces and her nephew. So now, after her sister's devastating death, it looked like the rest of her family was also just abruptly out of her life. But Christina's story, it wasn't over because the fire that killed her still needed to be investigated. Not by the police like you might expect, but by her and Carl's insurance company. Because get this, just 20 days before the fire, Carl took out a $250,000 life insurance policy out on Christina. We always say, the life insurance policy speaks volumes, right? Because that timing alone is already a bit of a red flag. But then when you add in all of those other little oddities and Carl's behavior, it's unsurprising that the insurers wanted to gather a bit more information before they paid out such a massive claim. And honestly, it never ceases to amaze me that people will leave this trail behind and not if think to even wait longer if they're trying to be strategic about it. Maybe get the policy a year in advance, two years in advance, but when you're getting it two or three weeks in advance of then a mysterious death happening, mm, it's going to throw up a red flag. And it did for the insurance company. So they began by interviewing Carl and asking for a complete breakdown of how he spent the day of the fire. Carl said that he went to work around 5.30 or 6 a.m., but that when he got there, he realized that nobody was there because it was New Year's Day, a holiday, so he decided to go home. He said that he was back at his place around 9 a.m., so while Christina did some housework, he apparently was watching football. Then he took down the Christmas tree. His oldest daughter also corroborated that detail, but with one very important addition. She said that her dad took the kids to the backyard, that he doused the tree in gasoline, and then he set the tree on fire. Now apparently, Carl did this because he wanted them to see how fast a house can burn. A direct quote according to the child. I mean, how big of a moron do you have to be? But we love to see it, right? 
So before I move on from this point, I also want to highlight just how weird his whole story already was. I mean, first, we know that New Year's Day is a pretty major holiday. It's not like Carl showed up at work on President's Day or Arbor Day or even Veterans Day for that matter. It's super odd that he didn't realize that he had the day off. And that's all before we even touch on Carl burning the Christmas tree in the backyard. I mean, at the very least, it's safe to say that he definitely had fire on his mind right before his home caught flames. And that comment about seeing how fast a house can burn? I mean, why would he even bring that up unless he somehow knew that his house was going to ignite right afterward, right? So eventually, the kids went to take a nap, and Christina took a bath. So Carl began doing some electrical work in the house at that point, and at one point, he went to the garage to get electrical wire and tools. That's when, all of a sudden, he heard Christina screaming. She was shouting that he had to save the kids, but Carl said he didn't know what was going on or what he was supposed to be saving them from. So he tried to run back inside, and that's when he realized that a fire had ignited. The whole house had just turned into this, gosh, what would you even say, like a deadly inferno of sorts. He said that he couldn't even get through the front door. So instead, he ran around to his son Levi's bedroom and he broke a window. He climbed inside, he grabbed Levi, and he was about to pull him out when this huge ball of fire just tore through the room. So Carl only had time to toss his son out of the window and then dive out after him. But even this like superhero type action that you're envisioning in your mind of him jumping out the window after throwing his son out, that didn't even stop the fire from singeing his face. Luckily, the flames didn't reach little Levi though, although he did get a bloody nose from falling out of the window. But later when the paramedics arrived on the scene, they didn't see any injuries on Carl. He looked fine and he also had no signs that he had been burned. Now either way, Levi was safe but Carl's two daughters, Aaron and Katie, were still inside. In fact, Carl could hear them yelling for help in their bedroom. So again, he ran over, he smashed the glass, and he pulled the girls out to safety. And according to Carl, he also tried to break the bathroom window so that he could save Christina as well. But he said that it wasn't as easy as with the kids. In fact, the bathroom window had broken a few days earlier, and as a temporary solution, Carl had nailed a wooden board over it until they could get new glass to replace it. So now he was trying to pry the board off, but it was nailed down and it was nailed down so well that he couldn't pull it off. So when it became clear that Carl couldn't get the board down, he apparently loaded all three of the kids into a truck and that's when he drove to the neighbor's house where he called 911. Which let me say, I understand that it's important to call for help as soon as you possibly can. But when Carl told this story, Everyone who heard it thought that something was just off. Something just felt very off about it. See, the board on the window had a lot of nails in it, 17 in total. I mean, it just seemed very excessive for a temporary fix because once Carl bought a new window pane, he was gonna have to pull all 17 of those nails out again. And according to Carl's story, while he was rescuing the kids, the fires hadn't reached the garage yet and the garage was where he kept all of his tools. So instead of just driving off and leaving his wife behind, you would think that he could have grabbed some equipment to, I don't know, help him get the board off of the window, and the window wasn't even very high up or hard to reach at all. I don't know about you, but if my spouse was trapped in a burning building, I would have been doing everything I could do to try and save them and get them out of there. But it sounds like Carl barely made any attempt to help Christina at all. In fact, his own daughter Erin said that she never even saw Carl try to rescue her mom, period. According to her, he just loaded the kids in the truck and then took off. Then, get this, he started talking about how Christina was in heaven. This was all before the fire truck or the ambulance had even arrived. It was almost like he had already totally written Christina off as dead already. I mean, so, so eerie and unnerving. And this became even more suspicious when the insurance company talked to the firefighters and also talked with the other first responders who were on the scene. They said that the entire house reeked of kerosene, which is no surprise because there was a huge splash of kerosene right by the bathroom door, which is also where the fire started. 
there was also a trail of kerosene and just a trail of kerosene that kind of dribbled and led all the way out from the bathroom door into the living room. Plus, they found piles and piles of clothing near that spill where the kerosene was and even more pieces of clothing that were just strewn kind of all through the hallway. Which, I mean, hello, I think we all know what that means, right? Except here's the thing. When they asked Carl about it, he said that a few days before the fire, Christina carried what she thought was a five-gallon jug of water into the house. And actually, the jug of water was full of kerosene, which they learned apparently when one of their pets knocked the jug over and then spilled it right in front of the bathroom. This was Carl's story. So Carl said that he and Christina tried to mop it up with some clothing that was already sitting in a pile in the hallway. Apparently, they were old and a bit worn out, so they didn't mind if the clothing got stained using them for the cleanup, which makes absolutely zero sense. But according to Carl, they cleaned up what they could, and then they tried to dry the kerosene-soaked clothing out so that they could keep it. But apparently, when they tossed it all into the dryer, it then set off the smoke alarm. So instead, they just draped the items of clothing, the garments, over the couch and in the living room to, like, let them air out. And according to Carl, on New Year's Day, a light fixture fell. It sparked, and then that is what ignited the fire. So he said the fire was a complete accident after a long string of series of unfortunate decisions, which I think we can all agree and just acknowledge how bizarre this entire story is from beginning to end, right? First of all, yes, the Carlsons did keep jugs of water and kerosene around, but the containers looked pretty different from one another. So it would be very difficult for Christina to somehow confuse the two and bring kerosene into the house. And not only that, but even if she did bring in this huge jug of kerosene and left it sitting in front of the bathroom for whatever reason, some reason or another, it's unclear how their dog or their cats could have knocked it over. Because I looked it up and a five gallon jug of kerosene weighs 35 pounds. So assuming that it was full, it would take a lot of effort for a very small animal like that to push something that heavy over. Then, if you add in the fact that Christina was very, very tidy, kind of type A, very organized, and took her homemaking duties super seriously, she wouldn't just leave a pile of worn-out old clothing sitting in the hallway. And she definitely wouldn't leave any new clothing out, which, for the record, some of the pieces of clothing that were found by the firefighters were brand new, including Christmas gifts that Christina gave Carl that very year, just six or seven days earlier. So again, it makes you question Carl's claim that they decided to use these pieces of clothing as towels instead of just grabbing rags or towels, right? But also, Christina wouldn't have put kerosene-soaked clothing in the dryer. She would have known that that wouldn't work before any fire alarms went off. It just did not make any sense. And this brings me to the final improbability, that Christina and Carl would drape the soaked clothing over the living room couch. Not only would this make the entire house smell like gasoline, but it would be a massive fire hazard. And again, you would think that Christina would have objected if Carl tried to do something that was so dangerous. So Carl's story just obviously was not adding up, but you can still do the math and come to a pretty clear conclusion here which is that Carl set the house on fire, and then he lied to make it seem like it was an accident. And as for his motive, well, Carl was several months behind on rent, and he owed his landlord a lot of money. So because of that, Christina's life insurance policy and that payout would definitely be enough money to help keep his head above water. And interestingly, or I guess not so surprisingly, I guess you could say, she wasn't there when Carl bought the policy. He was alone when he met with the agent. Initially, he said he only wanted to insure Christina, aka the one and only person to die in the fire. However, the company wouldn't do that. They needed Christina there. So instead, Carl figured out this workaround where he then took a policy out on his whole family, including the children. So it's no wonder why the insurance company was of course suspicious, right? Their investigation lasted for several months, and the entire time, Carl acted increasingly irritated with their questions. Like if anybody suggested that maybe he could have done more to save Christina, he would just fly into a complete rage. 
I mean, let me set the stage for you. Like pounding on the table, just shouting. And once he even blurted out, if I was in this for the money, I would have went after the kids too. What a piece of shit. And that probably wasn't the winning argument he thought it was because Carl seemed pretty unhappy being a single parent. He would complain often, and this is a direct quote. He said, being a father of three kids is a complete bitch. He also didn't really express the emotions that you'd expect after a deadly fire. No one ever heard him say that he was relieved that his children had survived and also had never heard him say that he was sad that Christina, his wife, was gone. But again, we know none of that proves anything, right? Everybody expresses their feelings differently. And while it's true that his story about kerosene-soaked clothing sounds extremely, extremely weird, it didn't mean that he had committed arson. At best, Carl and Christina could have made very bad, very reckless decisions leading up to this huge fire, and maybe it was, in fact, an accident. So because they couldn't prove anything, the insurance company ruled that Christina's death was, in fact, an accident, and they sent Carl a check for $250,000. However, this didn't go very far, especially now that Carl was trying to make his life work as a single parent. Remember, Christina had handled all of the housework, all of the childcare, and now Carl didn't know what to do with three children on his own. It was a lot for him. But a few months after he moved to New York, Carl was line dancing at a country bar when he saw a woman who caught his eye. When the dance was over, Carl walked over to her, and she introduced herself as Cindy. They started talking, and Carl ended up telling her about how he was a widower, a single dad, and how his wife had died in a horrible house fire. Cindy mentioned that she had always wanted to be a mom, but that she couldn't have kids. So they each had something that the other wanted. If they got together, Cindy could step right into this new family and be a mom to Carl's children. And sure enough, Cindy and Carl began dating, and they were only together for nine months before they got married in August of 1993. The wedding was a small courthouse wedding, and Carl's children were the only guests besides the couple themselves. He and Cindy ended up buying his parents' old farm, and not long after they moved, Cindy, miraculously, in spite of what her doctor said, got pregnant. So she gave birth to a very healthy son named Alex. But much like what happened with Christina, Cindy began to realize that Carl, he wasn't the sweet, supportive guy that he had made himself out to be. He was egotistical, and he seemed to be angry more often than not. They fought about money all the time, too, especially once Cindy began catching Carl lying about his finances. He would take out bank loans, he would overdraw their accounts, and he wouldn't say anything to her, ever. Now, of course, it was inevitable that Cindy would find out all of these things. But whenever she would confront him about it, he would just become furious and he would lash out at her. These arguments always ended with Carl calming down, apologizing, and of course promising that he would never, never blow up like that again. But I want to note that this is actually a fairly common theme in abusive relationships. The aggressive partner crosses the line, but then they retreat and they apologize and they act really remorseful afterward, and their victim forgives them for this. The problem is these apologies end up being empty completely and the abuse just continues. The National Domestic Violence Hotline website warns that this cycle can actually make the abuser feel like they have even more power over their significant other. Like they can keep saying that they're sorry and get this automatic forgiveness without ever even having to change their behavior or take real responsibility for their actions. And this kind of seemed to be what happened between Carl and Cindy. He kept hiding things and then blowing up at her, and she kept accepting his apologies, and the cycle just continued. On top of that, he treated Cindy more like a babysitter than his wife. He was always going out and doing whatever the heck he wanted while leaving Cindy alone with the kids. Once, right after they had moved in together, Carl even just up and left on a trip to Ohio with his dad. He never even called Cindy to see how things were going, even though this was the first time alone with all of the kids. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. It was like Carl got what he wanted, a new wife, a homemaker, 
and then he decided that he didn't need to try as hard to keep Cindy happy anymore. Carl was also super strict with the kids, which is pretty ironic, given that he apparently had very little to do with any of them. They all had chores, which often involved strenuous work around the farm, like tasks that generally aren't considered child appropriate. And even the youngest child was doing these kinds of chores. Plus, as they got older, Carl came to have a lot of conflict with his oldest son, Levi. By the time that he was 16, he was still having a really difficult time with his mom's death. He went to therapy for a while, but it didn't seem to help. Levi was depressed, and the sadness just seemed to constantly hang over his head. He started wearing black, he called himself goth, which Carl absolutely could not stand. He made no effort, though, to support his son during this hard time. Instead, he yelled at him, and according to Levi, Carl often beat him, sometimes with a tire iron. He seemed to think that Levi's goth tendencies were something that he just needed to quash, not a natural form of self-expression or anything like that. Carl even complained to Cindy that something was seriously wrong with Levi. And for her part, Cindy had no idea where Carl was coming from. I mean, yes, it was clear that Christina's death was hard on Levi, but that's to be expected, right? And as for the dark clothing, that's pretty normal teenage behavior even for someone who isn't dealing with the death of a parent. Everybody goes through self-expression in a different way. But Carl just couldn't be convinced that this was somewhat normal for Levi, and the alleged physical abuse continued. At one point, Levi called CPS, who came to the house and interviewed him. But there were some inconsistencies in his story, and since Carl and Cindy were away and there was no one else to corroborate what he had said, CPS just left. They didn't do anything about the report. So of course this family sounds pretty dangerous, a little bit of a dangerous dynamic and dysfunction element to it to me, but this wasn't even the worst that was going to happen, and it wasn't the worst that things could get. Around November of 2002, Carl ended up taking up a new business venture. He was trying to breed Belgian horses, however this venture, it was not going well. One of the horses that he bought ended up being infertile. So given how Carl had handled every other setback and frustration in his life so far, I have to imagine that he probably did not react well to this news. Then, one night that month, Cindy woke up and saw that Carl wasn't in bed. She figured he must have gone to the kitchen, maybe for a midnight snack. But when he came back to the bedroom, he said that he had been in the downstairs bathroom, which was weird because there was a much closer bathroom upstairs. But it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, it was weird, but it wasn't a mystery enough to where she needed to stay up late asking him questions or follow-up questions, so Cindy just went back to sleep. But then a little while later, she woke up again, and this time it was because Carl was yelling at her that their barn was on fire. This was a huge emergency because the Belgian horses, they were all trapped in this burning building. So Carl shouted at call 911, but he didn't even try to go to the barn to save the animals. He just sat there, and he waited for the firefighters to arrive, which was now definitely getting to be a pattern with him, right? And unfortunately, all of the horses died in that fire. And apparently, first responders thought that Carl seemed pretty anxious once the fire was out, but not worried about how the fire had started. Not like you would expect. In fact, he had a theory that an old radio that he kept in the barn must have short-circuited, and it threw sparks into the hay, and that's how the fire started. But he was really focused on cleaning up and getting all of the firefighters and everybody else to just leave. Not that there was a whole lot for them to do, but after they heard Carl's radio theory, they agreed that it sounded right. So they ruled the entire thing as an accident. And... As if you would guess it, or maybe not, but no surprise here, guess what? Just two weeks before the barn fire, Carl had increased the insurance coverage on the barn. It was a $20,000 policy to now a $115,000 policy. And wouldn't you know it, Carl had some really expensive equipment that would have been devastating to lose, even with the payout. But he had removed it all from the barn just a few days before the fire. And conveniently enough, Carl got his huge payout right as Christina's life insurance money ran out. 
right as Carl was starting to struggle financially again. And it was enough to finally set off some red flags in Cindy's mind. So she began digging into Carl's background a little bit more. She already knew about how Christina had died in a mysterious fire, but now she learned that the barn fire wasn't the second time that something like this happened to Carl. It was the third. See, way back in 1986, when Carl was 26 years old, he was almost bankrupt, right until his brand new Ford Mustang randomly caught fire. I've got to say, for a guy having three mysterious, deadly, and horrible fires take place in his life, that's a pretty big coincidence, right? Now, this destructive fire netted him $10,000 from his insurance company. But, in no surprise, Carl had removed all of his possessions from the car a few days before. He tried to act like this was all just, I don't know, some lucky coincidence, but I mean, come on. We all know by now that this couldn't have been an accident, right? And Cindy didn't think so either. She saw how any time Carl was struggling for money, he would find a way to make all of his financial problems go away, or go up in flames, I should say. So Cindy talked about her suspicions with Levi. See, he was also convinced by this point that Carl had set the barn on fire and that he had also had something to do with his mother's death. Although I'm not sure if he thought that she was murdered or if she died on accident as a result of the arson. Either way though, Cindy and Levi should have been more careful when they were discussing thoughts about fears and motives and what could be the truth because Carl overheard them and he flipped out. He physically attacked Levi, who only just managed to escape, got in his car, and then drove off. Carl got into his car, too, and chased Levi down, trying to run him off the road. However, somehow, Levi escaped this attack. But understandably, he did not feel safe going back home afterwards. So instead, he couch surfed with some relatives and then eventually moved in with his longtime girlfriend, Cassie. Like Levi, Cassie was a goth, except her mom supported her, so the family welcomed Levi in with open arms. It was like night and day from what he had been experiencing with his own father. And it was like finally Levi was in a stable environment. And when he and Cassie were both about 18 years old, she got pregnant with their first child. And they had a very quick wedding before she gave birth to a little girl. Eventually the couple bought a house and then they had a second daughter. However, on the night of June 17th, 2005, their house burned down. Luckily, nobody was home. Levi was working a night shift, and his wife and daughters were spending the night with other family members. But it was just one more mysterious fire that was threatening Carl's family members. I mean, what's the likelihood of that? But was it what it seemed? So by the time that he was 23, Levi was seemingly getting his life together, according to Carl. He was no longer a goth, which apparently just made Carl feel way better about his son. In fact, Carl got Levi a job at the same glass company where he worked, and it had good pay and also good insurance. So to all appearances, Carl and Levi were starting to move past their estrangement, and they were working together every day now. But unfortunately, Levi's relationship with his dad was improving right as his marriage began to go south. He really wanted to make things work with his wife, but it sounds like they just got married too fast, too young, all of these things. So Cassie filed for divorce, claiming that Levi was a drug addict who just wanted to smoke weed all the time. Because of this, Cassie won full custody rights over the kids, and Levi was only allowed supervised visits. Now, of course, Levi was completely devastated, and even his dad, Carl, could tell. And he gave his son some weird advice about how to deal with this new development, you could call it. Specifically, Carl suggested that Levi should take out a life insurance policy. Weird, right? I mean, how would this help somebody get custody of their children? Well, according to Carl, buying a life insurance policy would make Levi look like a prepared, responsible, and reliable father. Even though Levi was still very young, he could show the courts that he was thinking ahead, planning for his children's future, all of those things. So Carl said, the bigger the life insurance policy, the better. So we know that Levi and Carl didn't have the strongest relationship, 
But now Levi was willing to take Carl's advice. I guess he was just that eager to fix his custody situation. I don't know. So he ended up buying a life insurance policy worth $300,000. This particular policy also said that the beneficiary would get an additional $400,000 if the death was ruled an accident. So a total of $700,000 in the right circumstances. And who do you think Levi listed as the sole benefactor? Surprise, surprise, it was his father, Carl who wrote the check for the first month's payment and helped Levi sign up for it. Now let's pause for a minute and talk about how absurdly nonsensical this all was. The whole reason that Levi bought the policy was to show the courts that he was planning for his children's future, but his children wouldn't benefit from this policy, not at all. The only person that Levi was helping was his dad, You might expect Levi to be a bit more cautious about making Carl a beneficiary given everything that happened during his childhood too. But Carl told Levi that if he listed his daughters, it would be too easy for his ex Cassie to get that money if Levi died. But if Carl collected the payout, he would make sure that the money got to the girls. So a couple of weeks later, on November 20th, 2008, Levi was at Carl's house working on his Chevy pickup truck. This was one of Levi's favorite things to do. He was always fixing things, tinkering around. He just liked working with his hands, and he had always been interested in cars. Since they had reconciled, Levi had come over to Carl's farm a couple of times to repair things and help out with some of the maintenance. Sometimes Carl even paid him for his time, and others Levi just worked for cases of Mountain Dew, just something like a simple exchange as that because he just really enjoyed doing the work. But that day, Levi expected to make around $50, and he was working alone because Carl and Cindy were heading to a family member's funeral. Before they left, Carl helped Levi jack up his truck, but he did a pretty poor job doing it. The jack that he used was flimsy, and he didn't put anything under the tires to support them or stop them from falling if the jack slipped. And you probably know where this is going, right guys? because when they got home from the funeral that afternoon, Cindy and Carl saw that Levi's car was still in the driveway. Carl offered to go check on Levi in the barn and see if everything was okay. And after a few minutes, Carl came running back to the house yelling at Cindy to call 911. Of course, the truck had fallen off the car jack and it had fallen on to Levi, pinning him down completely. It was bad enough that when the 911 operator told them to do CPR, Carl said he couldn't. Levi's chest had caved in, and now he was also cold to the touch. 911, what's location of your emergency? I think I need an ambulance. Oh my God. I don't know how long you've been in there. Levi's got stuff all over his body. I don't know how long you've been in there. We've been gone since noon. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Yeah, Carl, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? There was no saving him. Emergency personnel arrived, and after a quick survey, they ruled the death as an accident. Now again, we know Carl's history, right? We know how many quote-unquote accidents seemed to happen around him. Almost always, right after he bought new insurance policies. And the people around Carl were also very good at spotting this pattern. In particular, Levi's brother Mike knew that Levi was a very experienced mechanic. He would have known how to safely jack up Carl's car, and he wouldn't cut corners ever when it came to safety. And on the day that Levi died, Carl even approached Mike and he asked, how do I explain this? Now Mike was really confused about what he meant. He's explain what? If it was really an accident, Carl wouldn't have to explain anything, right? Now, Cindy, she had her own suspicions. I mean, how couldn't she? She had been one of the very first people to discover Carl's pattern of fires, insurance payouts, all of it. And after Levi's death, she thought that Carl's reaction seemed almost rehearsed in a way. Like he came across as overly upset, running around, bumping into things, banging his head into a wall. But his emotional reactions were also almost stilted in a way like he was putting on a performance. And like I said before, everybody grieves differently. 
But Cindy knew Carl really well. They had been married for over 20 years at this point. She could tell when he was faking his feelings. And it seemed like that was exactly what he was doing again now. Especially in light of the fact that Carl had a financial incentive to want his son dead. Levi's will, which was just notarized on the day of his death, left everything to Carl. He didn't set aside anything for his own kids, which was especially strange because even though Levi and Carl had been starting to repair their relationship, they were still very much in the early stages. They weren't all that close, really. Now, Cindy also couldn't help but think that Carl had been in the garage with Levi for a very long time before they left for the funeral that day. At the time, Carl said that he just wanted to quickly check on Levi before they left, but that quick check ended up taking quite a while. And when she entered the garage after they got home, country music was blasting from the speakers. Cindy knew that Levi was not a country fan, but Carl was, meaning that Carl must have set the radio to the station before Cindy came in, and he wouldn't change the music if he was worried that Levi was going to die. So what was really going on here? The other explanation was that Carl may have been listening to country before Levi arrived, and that his son never even had the chance to put on his own music. See, Cindy wondered if maybe the Carl had rolled on to Levi before they even left for the funeral that day. Then, the life insurance checks started rolling in in the mail. Carl hadn't even told Cindy about how he had helped Levi buy a plan, or how he was named as the beneficiary. But he didn't have any other way to explain the now $700,000 that he suddenly received. Carl said that the money was for Levi's daughters, and that he was just going to hold on to it until they were a little bit older. And in fairness, he didn't use any of the money until Cindy needed an eye surgery a couple of years after Levi's death. Her surgeon offered to give her a facelift while she was under, but that was going to be an additional $8,000 that Cindy did not have. So Carl suggested that Cindy should use some of Levi's insurance money, which we know isn't what Levi left it for. That cash was for his kids, not for a facelift for Cindy. But Carl assured Cindy that they weren't stealing the funds, they were just borrowing a little bit, and then they would pay it back afterwards. So Cindy agreed to this. I guess there are no boundaries when you're selfish, right? But then, after the surgery, Carl began helping himself to the insurance money on a semi-regular basis. And each time that Cindy caught him spending it, he would get very defensive. He would say if it was okay for Cindy to borrow a few thousand dollars, why couldn't he? almost kind of guilting Cindy for her indiscretion so that she wouldn't be able to hold him accountable for it now because she did it too. Was that his plan all along? Get her to use a little bit of it so that he could excuse himself using it later on? Carl used the money to start a business raising ducks for local restaurants. He eventually had around 8,000 ducks and his business started gaining a lot of local attention. He appeared on TV and even in magazine articles. Carl absolutely loved the recognition as well, and he could not get enough of it. He never had been passionate about farming or ducks or poultry, I guess you could call it, but he absolutely loved, loved, loved being famous. Meanwhile, the rest of his family was seriously suffering, though, especially Cindy. She couldn't let go of her belief that Carl might be a killer. She remembered how abusive he had been before Levi died, too. So now, Cindy developed severe anxiety, and it made her physically ill, and it gave her headaches. It was just manifesting in so many physical ways. She was afraid that Carl might try to hurt her, too, and she slept with a knife underneath her pillow. The worst part of all of this was that Carl's family was so well-connected. So Cindy was afraid that if she went to the police, they wouldn't take her reports seriously. So instead, she hired a private investigator who discovered something very disturbing. I mean, even more disturbing than what Cindy already knew. See, Carl had taken out a life insurance policy on Cindy, and it was worth around $1.2 million. And he also had arranged additional coverage for his young grandchildren. So this was now the last straw for Cindy. 
She took her son Alex and she moved away to Kentucky. And luckily, Carl's other two living children were older now and had already moved out of the house. Cindy and Alex stayed in different hotels for a little while before Cindy finally gave in and bought a house using $100,000 from Levi's insurance payout. But Cindy wasn't content to just take off and leave her old marriage behind her. She still wanted to hear the truth from Carl. So Cindy and Carl talked on the phone a couple of times, and she recorded all of their conversations, which, I mean, good move, Cindy. First, she tried to get him to confess to the barn fire, but of course Carl was hesitant to come right out and say that he had said it. Then, she tricked him by pretending that she was interested in getting back together. But Cindy said that she couldn't take Carl back unless they went to dinner and Carl was completely honest with her. And Carl seemed to believe her, so they made plans to meet up. Cindy went and bought a tape recorder that she stuffed inside her shirt. Then, while they were eating at dinner, Cindy said that she knew about everything that Carl had done. She said the only way that they could ever get back together was if Carl confessed and told her everything. She even referenced Levi's death, and she asked, was it hard to push the truck? To which Carl replied, no. That was all he would say, though, which didn't feel like enough for Cindy to bring to the police. She didn't know what to do, so she called her cousin Jackie. This wasn't the first time that Cindy had vented about Carl to Jackie, but it was the first time that she had any kind of evidence whatsoever. Cindy was hesitant to take action, but Jackie wasn't. She called the police, and she told them what Cindy had said to her. When the investigators followed up with Cindy later, she was actually relieved because finally she could stop worrying and stop second-guessing herself and just share what she knew and then let the authorities take it from there. There was just one problem, though. She handed over that tape recording, and the detectives couldn't hear anything. I mean, she had just bought a cheap recorder at the store. It wasn't a professional mic or anything, and the police didn't have the equipment that they would need to clean up the audio. That technology probably honestly didn't even exist yet. So the investigators asked Cindy if she was willing to meet with Carl once again. She had to try and get another confession out of him, and Cindy agreed. So they met again for dinner, but this time, when Cindy started asking questions, Carl seemed pretty uneasy. Maybe because he felt like he had already told her what he had done, so he couldn't see why she would need to ask him again about everything and why he would need to admit to it again. So Cindy told him she could search her bag and she would prove that she didn't have any recording equipment on her. And he did. And that seemed to make him feel a little bit better. I guess he never even suspected the truth in all of it, that Cindy was wearing a wire underneath her clothing and four undercover cops were sitting inside that restaurant. Unfortunately, Carl still didn't give a clean confession though. Can you just tell me how things went that day? So that I just know in my head. Carlson grows suspicious of Cindy. Part of me feels like I'm walking into a booby trap. But he starts telling her more. When I went in there, I jacked it up. And what? Then it's wet. I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I didn't push the truck, I said. I said I had nothing to do, but I said I took advantage of the situation once it happened. I took advantage of the situation once it happened. It wasn't quite a confession, but it sure didn't sound good either. So his statements weren't enough for the police to arrest Carl, but they did now bring him in for questioning. There, they tried to get him to loosen up by appealing to his ego. They complimented Carl, told him that they admired him for his military service, and before you know it, Carl was talking non-stop. Singing like a canary, I think is the expression, right? The detectives steered the conversation to the day of Levi's death. They didn't even bring up the insurance money at all. But then Carl proactively just announced, you don't kill your son for money. You don't kill anyone for money. So then the detectives pressed him. They asked him why he had confessed to Cindy that he had murdered Levi. And Carl said that he was just testing his wife to see if he could really trust her. And then again, Carl's story changed. Now he said that Levi was crushed before he and Cindy left for the funeral. 
Carl said that he panicked and just left. And the police did have some pointed questions about how exactly Levi got crushed. For example, did Carl push the truck? But he avoided the questions. At one point, he said he was digging for blankets in the truck bed and that that accidentally caused the car to fall. I opened the truck door because I had to get inside to move the linkage for the truck. And when I did, it tipped and it just fell over. Although the murderer seemed premeditated to the police, they couldn't prove that it was. And Carl never admitted that he pushed the truck. At worst, he just said that he failed to take any action to save Levi's life. He also insinuated that Levi deserved what happened because he had misbehaved while he was a child. Still, this was enough for the police to arrest Carl, and they charged him with second-degree murder and insurance fraud. In 2013, Carl pleaded guilty to the charges. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. After this, the Seneca Falls Sheriff went on TV and called for California officials to look into Christina's death. Soon afterward, they opened a case on her. And luckily, the arson expert who originally investigated the case, Carl Kent, had never agreed with the initial ruling that the fire was an accident. All these years, he kept all of the evidence and his notes. So now, he turned it over to the officials, who also interviewed various friends and family members. Eventually, on the strength of their findings, Carl was charged with first-degree murder. In 2016, Carl was extradited to California, where he waited for his 2020 trial. During his hearing, the prosecution covered everything. The kerosene and the clothing in the hallway, the boarded-up window, Carl's strange behavior after Christina's death, I mean, you name it. Plus, they presented some new arguments. Now remember, Carl originally speculated that the fire began when a light bulb sparked, and then the sparks landed on the kerosene-soaked clothing that had been used as rags. Well now, the state knew that the particular lights that Carl used in his home and didn't generate enough energy to spark at all like that, so they couldn't have ignited an accidental fire. Then Carl's oldest daughter Erin took the stand, and she testified that she visited her father while he was in jail. She told him that she knew what he did, and Carl apparently didn't even deny it. He got this big, creepy smile on his face, and he said, It's been 20 years, haven't caught me yet, and they aren't going to. Which I have to just say, that is a bad thing to say if you know that the prosecutors are already closing in on you, right? And the jury heard about all of the other fires that had been linked to Carl. The one in his car, the one in the barn... They even brought up Levi's death, even though Carl had only been convicted of second-degree murder. So after the prosecution and the defense arrested, the jurors deliberated for two days before they found Carl guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As of this recording, he is serving his 15-year sentence in New York. And then once that one is finished, he's going to be transferred to California where he will spend the rest of his life locked in a cell, paying off his debt to society. Christina's remaining daughters, Aaron and Katie, were absolutely thrilled that their mother finally received the justice that she deserved. But it's absolutely tragic that the conviction came so, so late. If anybody had taken the situation more seriously and dug a little deeper, a little earlier, maybe Levi might still be alive. And it's also worth mentioning that Aaron and Katie aren't so sure that Cindy is totally innocent in all of this either. Now, obviously, this is just their speculation, and Cindy hasn't been charged with anything. But to hear Cindy tell it, she was suspicious of Carl all the way back in 2002, but she didn't take action until two years after Levi's death in 2008. Aaron and Katie think that Cindy actually knew way more than she let on, but that she kept her mouth shut so that she could keep living off the money from Christina's life insurance payout. But I guess my question is, what do you guys think? Was Cindy just genuinely scared to say anything? Or do you think that she kept quiet and helped Carl get away with it? I mean, it's wild to me that somebody could commit almost the exact same crime four different times in a row and not get caught especially if the people around him already have suspicions. This case was especially frustrating and bizarre, so I'm very, very interested to hear your thoughts about everything.
I'm just so happy that he was finally caught and there is justice and that there is not the potential for another victim to be in this long web of Carl's life. But let me know your thoughts in the comments and thank you for tuning into another episode. Until the next one, guys, stay safe. Bye.